What is gaslighting? According to Merriam-Webster, gaslighting is a psychological manipulation of a person, usually over an extended period of time, that causes the victim to question the validity of their own thoughts, perception of reality, or memories, and typically leads to confusion, loss of confidence, and self-esteem, uncertainty of one's emotional or emotional stability, and a dependency on the perpetrator. Did you know that Merriam-Webster declared gaslighting as the word of the year in 2022 when they saw a 1,740% increase in lookups for gaslighting? Today, in this episode of Hello, Trauma Brain, I want to talk about gaslighting and will use the film Gaslight to illustrate gaslighting and the cycles of narcissistic abuse. Hi. I am Raisa, a survivor of narcissistic abuse, and I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder, and you are listening to Hello Trauma Brain, a podcast where I share my experiences living with complex PTSD. My hope is this podcast can help destigmatize mental health and provide support for anyone diagnosed with CPTSD who thinks they might have it or has a loved one with this diagnosis. Quick reminder, I am not a licensed psychologist or mental health care professional, and this podcast is not meant to replace nor substitute the care of psychologists, other mental health or medical health care professionals. If you think you might have complex PTSD or PTSD, please reach out to your primary care or mental health provider. This episode may reference trauma or abuse, and listener discretion is advised. Remember, you can always pause or skip this episode at any time. And now, let's get back to the episode. Hello, dear survivors, and welcome to this episode of Hello, Trauma Brain. Thank you for joining me. Quick check-in, I am feeling a lot better this week and safe in my home. Still got tons of things to do as usual, but it feels good to wake up with some normalcy back in my schedule. Today, I will be doing the first episode in the movie illustration series. I want to dedicate a monthly episode to using art to show what narcissistic abuse can look like in the real world. When I read a definition of a concept, it sometimes does not have the same impact as if I was seeing an actual example of the concept. This is why when I was doing my psychology major in college, I failed to realize a lot of the things I was learning applied to some people in my life, including myself. As I get better at discerning between healthy and abusive relationship dynamics, I want to provide these illustrations in the hope that they can help you understand this information too. Today, we will start with the film Gaslight. The version I will use for this episode is the 1944 film directed by George Cukor, starring Charles Boyer, Ingrid Berman, Joseph Cotton, and Angela Lansbury. And by the way, this is Angela's film debut. This episode will only focus on using the movie to portray examples of gaslighting and the cycles of narcissistic abuse. I will link a website called Just Watch in the show notes where they list different ways you can see the film Gaslight if you would like to to watch it. Warning, there will be spoilers during this episode, so if you have not seen the movie yet and mind the spoilers, you might want to shelve this episode until you have seen the movie. If you don't mind the spoilers, then you are welcome to stick around. The reason this film matters is because this movie is linked to the origins of the word gaslighting. Before we dive in, Please remember that any individuals and resources mentioned in this podcast are not sponsoring Hello, Trauma Brain. I want to start saying a few things about the film. The film is based on a play by Patrick Hamilton that came out in 1938. And there was a British adaptation of the play that came out in 1940. It was a British film. And that film was followed by the American remake in 1944, the one directed by George Cukor. 
uh, George Cukor's uh, adaptation, it was nominated for 17 Academy Awards, and it won Best Actress. Uh, Ingrid Berman uh, won Best Actress for her performance. And if you've seen the movie, oh, did she earn it? <laughs> she did so good. Poor woman. I just wanted to give her a hug and just, like, scoop her away from there. And uh, it also won Best Production Design. In order to avoid confusion with the with the British version uh, in the, in the UK, they named the the American movie "The Murder in Thornton Square." And way back, I remember hearing something about the studios, the American and and the British studio, um, getting into some debacle over the film, and thinking, wouldn't that be ironic if like one studio was gaslighting the other <laughs> over this movie? I actually don't know that for a fact. I completely speculating but I I couldn't help to think that now back to the movie itself uh, a quick plot of the movie is uh, that it follows the story of Paula who had tragically lost her aunt Alice when she was younger now later on Paula ends up marrying Gregory a very abusive man who turns out to be the person that had murdered her aunt and was trying to run a scam to steal valuable jewels that Paula had inherited from her aunt. The main tactic used by Gregory included gaslighting Paula into believing she was going crazy. Paula is able to realize what is happening after a detective, Brian Cameron, validates Paula's reality and helps her bring Gregory to justice for his crimes. Now, before we go into the movie, I want to I wanna dive deeper about what is gaslighting. Now, there are different steps in gaslighting. And a common misconception that I have even made myself is thinking that lying is gaslighting. And lying is lying. And though lying is a part of gaslighting, that's not enough. I like to think about it like a formula. And it includes the lying and then twisting the situation so now there is something wrong with the victim. So it's not just lying, it's lying and then, and there's something wrong with you for even thinking that or perceiving that or remembering that way. It's denying reality. And we're not talking about subjective reality. We're talking about something that actually happened. And uh, you got to be careful because some manipulators actually use this whole, well, this is my reality as a way of further confusing their victim. Gaslighting is a manipulation tactic, and it leads the victim to question their sanity, ability to reason, and their own judgment. It's a slow form of brainwashing, and very effective, especially when there are no third parties or witnesses involved. Isolation is key, and unless the other people involved are in the gaslighting scheme as well, uh, you know, having someone who's actually validating reality is going to make it hard for that person to get completely gaslit, which is why it's common for abusive people to isolate their victims. According to Dr. Ramani, gaslighting is a mental assault and emotional abuse. When gaslighting, the goal of the abuser is to get the victim to rely on them as the only reliable source of information. Now, there are different types of gaslighting, and I want to quickly go through each, each one using the movie to portray an example. So in the movie, we see the classic version of gaslighting, which is one person to another, Gregory gaslighting his, uh, his girlfriend at the beginning and then wife Paula. There's also gaslighting by proxy, which is when you have someone else do the gaslighting. And this happens in the movie with the staff, mate Nancy and mate Elizabeth, tell Paula there's no noises upstairs and she must be imagining things. And, uh, and with mate Elizabeth, I, I do remember uh, that she was deaf. So I, I think she actually couldn't hear the noises, but she was still gaslighting because it was not just saying, I don't hear anything. It was adding that you must be imagining it, that there's something wrong with you. You're making it up. That addition, again, it's not just denying the reality. You also have to twist it back to there's something wrong with you. And that's what makes the gaslighting. There's also gaslighting by tribe. That's more of like embedded in a larger group. Uh, it can also look uh, like a cultural dynamic. For example, this is just an example, like all women thinking or kind of like pushing the narrative of you don't you're not allowed to divorce your spouse you're not allowed to leave or or 
challenge them, for example, or when children are told, you must respect your parents, doesn't matter what they do, you need to honor them. So in the movie, the the neighbor, Miss Bessie, and uh, this is the scene before, before they're actually neighbors, like this is back when Miss Bessie meets Paula in the train. She tells Paula that she shouldn't be going to Lake Como on her own. I, the, her words are, is that wise? And that's more of that, like, gaslighting by tribes. Like, something's, is something okay with you? Like, do you think that's okay? Like, that seems wrong. And it's that discouragement. There's also the self-gaslighting that uh, we see in the movie. And self-gaslighting, in order for that to start happening, usually you have to be gaslit for a long time. So either you grow up in a household where you're gaslit uh, through your developmental years or you have been in a long-term relationship with someone where you're just constantly getting gaslit to the point where you start doing it to yourself. And uh, usually what happens in that scenario is you internalize the narrative that your perception is not reliable. And when you're self-gaslighting, that's, to me, that's, that's very serious. That's, that's the point where you're, you're really indoctrinated into this, into this abuse. And you see it right off the bat at the beginning of the movie. You know, Paula finishes the maestro's sentences. Like, I don't sing like my aunt. It is no use. Like, she already knows what he's going to say. So she goes ahead and, and devalues herself. Gaslighting also makes the victim feel incompetent. And again, this is one of the very first forms of gaslighting we see in the film. Before Gregory even comes into the picture, the maestro says, you look happier and you sing worse. It's like clipping, there's, there's this clipping of the wings, this forget about singing narrative that gets pushed over. Again, devaluing the person and something is wrong with you. And, and, and she has a beautiful voice. And she's been told that she doesn't sing like her aunt, so it's not good enough. And the thing is, when Paula moves into the house, she says she wants to study music again. Like, you can tell she wants to sing, but the voices around her are not encouraging it. Now, in order to continue this discussion on gaslighting, I want to use an article by Dr. Stephanie A. Sarkis that she wrote for Psychology Today, and I will link the article in the show notes. Uh, The article is called 11 Red Flags of Gaslighting in a Relationship. So I'll go one by one and give examples from the movie that I was able to pick up. Number one, they tell blatant lies. Gregory rages after being confronted with a letter that Paula finds from Sergis um, Sergis Bauer at the beginning of the movie. And spoiler alert, that's actually his real name. And he plays up the rage as just being upset about the awful memories that are disturbing Paula. More lies that Gregory says, besides hiding his real identity and real name, is the fact that he has a wife. He was married. And here he was marrying Paula on top of that. And I'm sure the wife, whatever she was, didn't have a clue that this was happening. He denies to Bessie that Paula's not home. So he he also lies to other people. It's not just Paula. Um, There's a scene in the movie where he tells Paula, we're going out even though he had not mentioned it. So she's like, we are? <laughs> and then he plays it off like, oh, it was a surprise. <laughs> Again, that that just blatant lies. He uh, One of the most insidious scenes in the film is when later on, you know, like you, we, we see when she finds the letter and we know she, she had found that letter from, from Bauer. And later in the movie, when she brings that up, he's like, what are you talking about? He denies that the letter even existed. Again, it's, it's very destabilizing when, you're, when you know something happened and someone is just acting like you made it up. And again, this goes back to, it's not about subjective things like, what sauce is the best one? Like, that's, that's somebody's opinion. That's not what we are talking about here. We're talking about the fact that someone held a letter and now they're being told that didn't even happen. Other things that Gregory tells Paula is that her mother was crazy. Again, it's these lies piling on to each other, and they're not just lies, but they're lies that set up this narrative of you come from these <laughs> these crazy people, and you are crazy, and you're making this up, and these things that you think happened never did when they actually did. It's, again, <laughs> it's very confusing, and if, if you're kind of like, what the heck is going on, uh, uh, that actually captures exactly what a victim is feeling in those moments. Sign number two. They deny they ever said something, even though you have proof. And this one, oh my gosh. (laughs) 
let me tell you, there, there are very few things that are crazy you're making than to have an actual recording of someone saying something and they still manage to deny it. Like, it's just mind blowing. And in the movie, we see some of these dynamics. Like Gregory says he has never been to London, but then later on gets caught in that lie because he knew where the jewels were. So he deflects it like, oh, the guy told, told me where, where they were. And he calls Paula absent-minded. Again, like it's not just denying and being caught on the lie and like sticking to this lying narrative, but adding that oh, you're so absent-minded. Like how could you miss that the guy told me? There was no guy telling him. He just knew where they were because he had been to London before and he had been doing the research on where to find these jewels. Even at the beginning, uh, there's a, there's a gentleman when, when the murder happens, and I don't think they disclose the name of the guy, but when Paula's traveling away from the home, this person tells Paula, you need to forget what happened there. Think of the future, not the past. It's like Paula is getting primed to the night events in her life. And that's that's part of that. Again, that, that is, it almost sounds like a grooming, well, maybe not grooming, but um, but again, just this pushing this narrative on this woman of don't rely on your recollection, just forget it, just move on. And it's not it's not a good way to support someone who just lost their aunt, is it? Dr. Romani often says one of the signs that points out to gaslighting is feeling like you need to record conversations to be able to hold on to your reality. Like if you if you feel like you need to turn on the, <laughs> your voice memo feature on your iPhone to record this, or you're saving the emails and you're rereading them a hundred times, that's that's a telltale sign something's going on. Because a healthy person, when you talk to them, you don't leave the conversation confused and almost like wondering what the heck happened. Sign number three, they use what is near and dear to you as ammunition. Alice, for example, uh, we don't see much of her in the movie, but uh, we do know that she was a singer and she was strangled. And as, as a singer, losing her voice, being strangled, you know, being murdered by, by using her, literally like, you know, her throat to end her life. That's like the ultimate way of having a voice taken away. And even Paula, like Paula was a kind person and, and she wanted to treat the staff with respect and that was something she held dear. And Gregory forces her to ring them and makes it look like Paula is the one that's being needy and being unreasonable with them and pushing that narrative when, when the reality was Gregory was the one who was inappropriate and mean to the staff. Gregory doesn't allow Paula to go to the reception of Lady Dalroy. Again, something that she holds dear. She really respected that woman. And at first, his check was like, we're not going. And Paula even, and this is one of the moments where Paula's like trying to push back on the, on the narrative. She's like, I'm going to go alone. And then he joins her. And poor Paula pays the price for that. Because in that public appearance, Gregory manipulates the situation to make Paula look unstable and unwell. And they end up leaving. Sign number four. They wear you down over time. Gregory is constantly saying things to Paula like you're absent-minded and moving things around the house and making it look like she was the one who had moved them. It's uh, even with the brooch. The brooch was one of the very first instances we see in the movie. It's this concept of you can't trust your memory at all and the pictures missing on the wall. Poor Paula, like, is over time. It, it keeps happening. You could tell, like, the I think the movie just shows the portrait or the picture missing, like, once, but they do reference, like, this keeps happening. Things that are piling on to each other, events that keep reinforcing that narrative of something is wrong with me. I must be losing it. Gosh, I keep forgetting things. I keep losing things. And it gets to the point where you don't rely on yourself anymore. Now, uh, a good way to portray this is uh, using that frog in the boiling water um, analogy. So if you, if you throw a frog on boiling water, it jumps right out. It's really hot. They know they, they can't be in there. Now, if you put the, the frog in a pot with cold water and you slowly turn up the heat, the frog actually stays there. It gets acclimated to the gradual change in temperature to the point where by the time the frog realizes what's going on, they're boiling to death already, and it's too late to jump out. Side number five, their actions do not match their words. 
the beginning of the movie, Paula tells Gregory she needs some time to get used to trusting happiness and to think about this. And he's like, oh, yeah, take all the time you want. However, he shows up at the train station not allowing her to have any time to think about whether she wants to marry him. All through the movie, we, we see him professing this huge love for Paula while his actions are anything but real love. When you're abusing someone, when you're manipulating them and using them, that's not love. That's abuse. That's obsession. That's manipulation. That's insidious. Sign number six, they throw in positive reinforcement to confuse you. This one gets me whew, a lot. This is how I, uh, this is why I still struggle to see some of the abusive people in my life because I get caught into, well, they're nice to me and they did say they love me or they did say, um, they did compliment me or whatever have you. Now in the movie, this looks like Gregory tells Paula, wow, you look like summer day and follows that right into the meaning here about being forgetful and losing things. It's like sprinkles, sprinkles that can confuse you and make it seem like they care. But in reality, they're still putting you down. Sign number seven, they know confusion weakens people. The brooch, the pictures, the gaslights dimming. Gregory tells Paula, you're inclined to lose things. It's like that constant confusion. Uh, Paula, for example, she says, I will remember where the brooch is. And he's like, well, I was just teasing about referencing that she, she's inclined to lose things. And it's that famous, I was just joking. And that's, 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 a <laughs> that's one that I'm very familiar with. I have lost count of how many times I have called out something that was said to me that was mean and the person just goes, I was just joking or can't you take a joke? And here in the movie, you know, we see Paula having a disturbing recollection of the murder and not wanting to stay in the house. And Gregory doesn't acknowledge it. Instead, he starts talking about moving the jewels, which, by the way, was so, so he could do his little scam. You know, you, you're, you're talking about something and then they just go off on a different tangent and you're almost confused like well didn't I just weren't we just having this conversation and all of a sudden it turns into something else just adding to that confusion so there's no there's no reciprocity here like if somebody tells me that they're recollecting uh, a murder I, I, I would want to soothe them and, and and see how I can help I wouldn't just go like oh well let's talk now about hot dogs and pizzas like what <laughs> what <laughs> all right sign number eight they project. During the interview with Nancy, Gregory says, Paula is particular about things being correct. And then adds, so am I. That's the projection. Paula wasn't particular about where things were. He was. That's a common thing that abusers do. They, they basically accuse the people around them of doing the things that they are doing. A common example of this is someone who's cheating on their significant other and somehow they end up being constantly the one accusing the significant other of being the cheater, even though they are the ones doing the cheating. Back to the movie, Gregory gets jealous the first time Brian meets Paula. And he accuses Paula of being disloyal, even though he's the one who's cheating on his wife and lying about being married with someone who's somewhere else. Gregory is constantly calling Paula a liar. When, let's face it, the man was lying from the beginning of the film. Sign number nine, they try to align people against you. Gregory uses the staff against Paula throughout the whole film. Mate Nancy was even in on the scheme with him. And Mate Elizabeth, though I will again acknowledge that the woman was deaf, she still didn't validate when Paula pointed out noises. And also, I'm going to add, you know, part of the problem here with, with Maid Elizabeth is she's probably hearing Gregory pushing this narrative of something is wrong with Paula, something is wrong with Paula. So that's also what she is going to be seeing. It's almost like he's priming everybody to notice any behavior in Paula as odd, unstable, and unwell. Sign number 10. They tell you or others that you are crazy. It goes back to Gregory constantly telling the staff that Paula's losing her mind. She's not well. She's highly strong. Even at the party during the meltdown, Gregory tells the host that Paula does not feel well and we have to leave. Like it goes back to Paula being the problem. She's the one who's crazy. He even threatens her to put her in a mental institution. 
Now, in, in the movie, there was a scene where, oh my gosh, I almost like lost it <laughs> during that scene. Towards the end, like the staff is trying to protect uh, Paula by by not admitting that they had seen Cameron there. I think they were trying to like give him time to get the authorities involved and, you know, buy some time so uh, Gregory wouldn't flee. That moment when Paula knows she saw this man and had this interaction and then the staff who had seen him started saying, what are you talking about? There was nobody there. Like you could see that woman about to go into a mental crisis. It was a breakdown and it really, really broke my heart. Like I remember being in my seat, just like jumping up and down, like, oh my gosh, somebody please help this woman. She's going to lose it. Like she actually will end up somewhere if, if somebody doesn't step in here and help this poor woman out. Sign number 11, they tell you everyone else is a liar. Gregory tells Paula that Brian told her lies about him because he was in love with her. Now, this goes back to wanting her to be isolated. Even the neighbor who's trying to hang out with Paula, Gregory doesn't allow her to spend time with Paula. He keeps pushing on this narrative of you need to be on your own. You're not well enough to be around people to further make the gaslighting more effective. Having people around makes gaslighting harder because other people can validate Oh, yeah, I did see that. Oh, I do remember that. Yeah, he did say that. Now, I also want to go through the four phases of a narcissistic relationship cycle and use the movie to show you what um, those phases can look like. The first phase is love bombing. Paula and Gregory got married after two weeks of this passionate courting. It was quick. There was no time to reflect. He didn't even let her go to the lake to think about it. And Love Mummy can look like different things, but in the movie, they portray it a little bit more in the classical way, which is like getting married quickly and moving in quickly. And one thing that Gregory does is he's asking Paula all these things at the beginning, like, what did you dream of? And it's, it's a tactic where, you know, very quickly the abuser is trying to get these private details, these, these almost like they want to know all your deepest secrets so they can use it as weapons later. And we have like the the classical <laughs> example of love bombing and like going on a honeymoon and like this lavish thing that again happened quickly, like two weeks dating and then getting married. That's that's quick. The second phase is devaluing. This is when Paula is constantly compared to her late Aunt Alice, uh, how she was a better singer than her, how she's also compared to the looks of her aunt. Gregory devalues Nancy too. So he's not only devaluing Paula, there's other people that he'll devalue, which tends to be a a common dynamic. Uh, You know, an abuser won't just abuse one person. They'll manage to abuse other people too. And in the movie, during the interview, he tells Nancy something along the lines of like, well, you dress loud. And he calls her Lucy. And that's not her name. And it's almost like a tactic, like you don't matter to me enough to even learn your name. Another example of devaluing in the movie was when he tells, uh, I think it was mate Nancy, like, can you give skincare secrets to Paula to help her get rid of her pale skin? And by the way, Paula is in the room when he's saying this. It's like so demeaning and cruel and insulting. And it's just, again, like you can just see this poor woman just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking as she gets more and more devalued. The third phase is when the person gets discarded. Now, this carding can happen both ways. Either the victim breaks up with the abuser or leaves the abuser or the abuser leaves or breaks up with the victim. In the movie, it shows both ways, actually. There is Gregory discarding Paula when he is threatening to send her to the mental asylum for a long time. And by the way, you notice that he already has his little supply <laughs> side piece all queued up to go the moment that happens because we knew that May Nancy was ready to go to take care of him when Paula is taken away, which tends to be what happens in these relationships. Usually if the abuser is going to discard the victim, they tend to have their next supply ready to go, which is uh, sometimes uh, (laughs) something that quite hurts the victim because it feels like they moved on so quickly and Again, it's, it's, it's just, it's sad. It's really sad, but these people don't, don't go that deep. So it makes it easier for them to just move on quickly. And again, I want to emphasize that, that fast pace, you know, just as fast as within two weeks, they're ready to marry you. (laughs) Within two weeks of breaking up, they're marrying someone else. And then we see the opposite way that this card can happen, which is when Paula leaves. 
Gregory. Now, there is a fourth face uh, hoovering, which gets shown in the movie. But real quick, a hoover comes from the vacuum. It's like the concept of you being sucked back in. And this happens during the final confrontation between Paula and Gregory. You know, the authorities are on their way. She's ready to leave this man. And he goes back into trying to suck her back in by saying things like, remember the first days, remember Italy, remember this, remember that. Usually hoovering includes them saying everything you ever wanted them to say. The apology, the remember how great it was. Oh, we're going to we're gonna take another trip and it's going to be amazing. And, you know, everything you ever hoped they would say is coming out of their mouth and it is seductive. It's almost like, wait a second, how can I leave when finally what I want is happening? And when hoovering is successful, it does suck the person right back in into the relationship. And then the cycle repeats itself and it goes back to the love bombing and the devaluing and the discard and so on and so forth. Now, something I have uh, heard, and I will say, I think it's true for how I have experienced these relationships in the past. Every time you get sucked back in, the love bombing period gets shorter and shorter. Now, the hoovering attempts did not work on Paula in the movie. She is able to see what's happening, to discern that this is just more lies, and she doesn't go back. She she lets the authorities get him and bring him to justice, which is um, quite quite the ideal scenario and not usually what happens in real life. But uh, I'll, I'll take a win in a movie when I can get it. A few things worth noting about the movie, and this is more of just, I love films, I love movies, and I love like dissecting little details and picking up on things. So some things I noticed were when Aunt Alice dies, the gas lights are turned all the way down. To me, it represents that dimming, just like you keep disappearing little by little until it goes completely black. And it's, it's like almost like a symbolism to like your end, like you're a shell of yourself. Paula asked for the gas lights to be turned up because the dark is unsettling to her. And it's again like that symbolism of like she doesn't want to disappear. She doesn't want to. And she wants she wants them back up. She wants to be herself. She wants to be able to to live and to to thrive. To me, dark is a symbol in this movie for losing your sanity and even your life. Gaslighting makes you look unstable and dysregulated. And some other examples that we see in Paula that probably, um, to me, hint a bit of uh, complex trauma presentation is when she's reading the book and she keeps ruminating. And that's a common thing for survivors. And it's definitely common for me, like reading the sentences over and over and over. It's like that problem with the concentration. Paula also uh, gets the point where she has trouble trusting. And even when Brian shows up and he, he says that the aunt gave him the glove and he can show the glove. There's the proof that he's saying the truth. Paula's hesitant to trust him because she had been gaslit for so long and convinced that nobody else is reliable and they're all lying to me to the point where she was like, you know, her first instinct was this man is lying when he wasn't. One of the many heartbreaking scenes in this movie is when Paula learns uh, about Gregory's real identity, Sergis, and how he had a wife in Prague and had planned the scheme from the night of Alice's murder. She says, if that were true, then that means from the beginning, there would have been nothing, nothing real from the beginning. That's a painful realization when we wake up from, from being in these abusive cycles. Towards the end, Paula starts getting her voice back. You know, Gregory even holds his hand trying to hold back that impulse to strangle her too because uh, Gregory wants to silence. Like he's that representation of silencing someone to the point where they have no voice left. Once Sergis gets taken away, Paula goes outside at night and the movie ends as the fog starts clearing. And to me, that fog represented that fog of abuse, that fog of gaslighting and confusion that is finally clearing away. So she can start taking in her reality for what it is, completely real, because she was not crazy. What can we do if we notice signs of gaslighting in our relationships? And the conversation, do not engage. The more you defend, 
the more you will get gaslit. Notice how you feel when the abuser is not around. When they go out on a trip or they're out at work, how is your life? Better? Worse? Or the same? Boundaries. It is okay to have a superficial relationship and not let them in, not tell them everything. Have you confronted the person about these dynamics? If you did, how did it go? Did they deflect or acknowledge your concerns? Find someone else that can validate your reality. Cameron was the saving grace for Paula. Getting outside opinion and perspective can help break the spell of gaslighting. Paula's monologue towards the end of the movie, where in a gist she's saying, like, if, if I'm mad and I'm losing things and I guess I lost a knife, oh well. <laughs> she plays into it, but from a place of being clear about what is happening. In this week's healing invitation, I want to offer you a few things to reflect about. Did any of the signs of gaslighting I mentioned sound like signs you have noticed in your relationships? Or did any of the faces of narcissistic abusive relationships also resonate? If so, are those relationships you want to keep? It might feel petrifying to think about this at first. This invitation is just to think about it for now. You don't have to make a decision at this moment. You can make it later. If you think you might be experiencing gaslighting or that you might be in an abusive relationship, can you find support? And this can look like a support group or someone you can run situations by. Having a sounding board and not isolating can become a powerful tool against gaslighting and abuse. Let's be the Brian Camerons out there too. Next time you notice someone else being gaslit or abused, are you able to talk to that person separately and validate their experience? The moment Brian tells Paula he sees the gas lights going down, she realizes she is not imagining it. We can do that for someone too. Hey, I saw that. Are you okay? How can I help? Do you want to talk about what happened? This goes back to properly supporting survivors. And if you have not, I invite you to listen to last week's episode called Supporting a Survivor to Learn More. I invite you to hold space for other people's feelings, judgments, and experiences. Lastly, I invite you to check out Dr. Ramani's free workshop on gaslighting that I will link in the show notes. Please let me know how this week's healing invitation goes if you choose to accept it. Before we wrap up this episode, all music and production is courtesy of yours truly. Also, I want to share a few ways you can support this podcast. You can subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or the platform you are using to listen. Share this episode with anyone you think can benefit from this content. Follow Hello Trauma Brain on Instagram. Subscribe to the Hello Trauma Brain YouTube channel and hit the notification bell to be the first to know when I post a new episode. And you can make a donation by getting me a coffee through the official bio site. No worries, all links will be provided in the show notes. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you found this episode helpful. I wish you the best as you become a sounding board against gaslighting and abuse. It is time for our farewell affirmations. You are welcome to repeat after me. I am enough. I am lovable. And I deserve to heal. I wish you a gentle week and thank you for listening.